It's October 18th, 1867, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. $7.2 million seems like costly real estate in 2023, so you can only imagine the mammoth investment it represented today in history in 1867, when the United States took possession of Russian America, or as we now know it, Alaska. But that price seems like more of a bargain when you know that it works out to a far more reasonable two cents per acre, even if at the time this vast territory amounted to little more than a handful of trading posts and an awful lot of tundra. And the transfer of power happened today in history despite the deal actually having been agreed between Russia and the United States in the spring, because that's how long it took to get there, which tells you a bit (laughs) about why (laughs) the Russians maybe weren't that keen on keeping it. Yeah, I mean, Russia itself had only ever loosely held on to Alaska. At their peak, they had around 800 people across the territory. But it's interesting, Alaska goes a long way back to the 16th century when Russia overran a Siberian territory that was known as the Khanate of Sibir, which was controlled by a grandson of Genghis Khan. And this key victory opened up Siberia. And within 60 years, then the Russians were at the edge of the Pacific. And eventually in the 18th century, Peter the Great, uh, who created Russia's first ever navy, wanted to know how far the Asian landmass extended to the east. He sent an explorer, Vitus Bering, and he then eventually claimed the land for the Tsar. Yeah, and a booming fur trade soon developed for Russian hunters who were trading with China. Actually, most of them were Siberian, and Alaska was sometimes referred to as Siberia's Siberia due to its remoteness and (laughs) the fact that there were so many Siberians now living there. But it wasn't Russia's only foothold in North America. I had no idea about this. Mm. In 1812, a boatload of Russian and native Alaskan hunters established Fort Ross in present-day Sonoma County, California. It lasted until 1841 when they sold it on. But even more incongruously... In 1816, a rogue agent of the Russian-American company, which is kind of like the East India Company of Russia, a guy called Georg Schaefer, he built three forts on Hawaii in an attempt to claim the island for the Russian Empire. That was not his remit. He had been sent there to recover a seized cargo. The forts were destroyed by Hawaiians the following year. But this is a moment in history where, you know, the 20th century superpowers were yet to be those superpowers, right? And for the United States, it's a very young country. It had only, in living memory at this time, acquired Oregon, annexed Texas, fought a war with Mexico and acquired California. So although it seems weird now, because you know how history turned out to think that the Russians had a port in California... You know, then it was a place to trade fur, which again, you know, if you're if you're the world's biggest market for <laughs> seal hats, then it's really great to own Alaska for a while, isn't it? The problem was, as a colonial settlement, they weren't interested in living there. Uh, and they were trying to govern it from St. Petersburg, half a globe away. And simultaneously, you know, they just weren't at a moment of enormous wealth and defeat in the Crimean War further reduced their interest in the region and basically they didn't want to uh, see Great Britain take control of this land and so the United States seemed like the least worst option at this stage. Yeah, Britain were in full empire mode by this point, and they had just consolidated their hold in North America. So in July of 1867, the three provinces which made up what was then called British North America had united to form the new country of Canada. But Mm. back then, there was a real danger that Britain was just going to expand into Alaska and take the whole top bit of North America. Which, frankly, I'm not saying this because I'm British. Does make sense, doesn't it? When you look at a map, Mm. like that territory should, if you like, either belong to Canada or Russia, right? If it's going to not be an independent place. You would never think it belongs to the country that borders Mexico (laughs) under Canada. No, exactly. Alaska doesn't border the US at any point. If you drove from the border of Washington State, it would be a 16-hour drive over 900 miles of Canada before you reached Alaska. The capital, Juneau, can only be accessed by ferry or air still. And to reach Anchorage would be a 40-hour drive from the continental United States. And yet by the 1840s, America was feeling quite expansionist. Secretary of State William Seward, who really drove the whole business of the acquisition of Alaska, wrote in March 1848, our population is destined to roll resistless waves to the ice barriers of the north and to encounter oriental civilizations on the shores of the Pacific. They had in mind that this was their, as they said themselves, manifest destiny. And yet, as they went to see these orientals, eyeball to eyeball, you'll notice that their manner 
Manifest Destiny doesn't include at any point consulting the indigenous population right. of the countries they're trampling through. <laughs> True. <laughs> no one thought to do that at any stage of this sale of Alaska. So you had Seward for the US. You had uh, Edward de Stockel, the Russian minister to the United States, who got the authorization from the Tsar to sell Alaska. It's obvious because it's 1867 that at no point would anyone consult the indigenous people. But it's extraordinary to think there were just Alaskan citizens who probably didn't know they were Russian in the first place and then didn't know that they'd been Mm. transferred to America. Yeah, and there were also lots who did know that they were under Russian rule and had kind of made peace with it in a weird way. You know, the the Russians had created, certainly compared to what happened afterwards, a kind of harmonious relationship with the local native people. So when the handover to the US occurred, there were about a thousand Russians in Alaska, 8,000 native people, and around 2,000 of what were called Russian Creoles. And they really saw themselves as belonging to both cultures. And under American rule, they would lose their privileged position and status. You know, America came sweeping in with this very much more inflexible racial hierarchy. And many of the Russian Creoles had their homes and their land appropriated by the newcomers. Yes, although it took the US quite a long time to do anything at all with its purchase of Alaska for nearly three decades after it made the purchase. I just sat there idly. And throughout many of these decades that followed, you know, it still was enormously polarizing. Some people referred to it as Seward's folly. Others called it Andrew Johnson's polar bear garden. There was this sense in the aftermath of the purchase that maybe this was a huge mistake. But... As time went on, uh, the whole Seward's Folly thing sort of fell apart, really, mainly because gold. There was gold there. So, I mean, this turned out to be a very savvy purchase, Mm. however you look at it. Yeah, in 1899, everything changed when the news came that three prospectors, who were nicknamed the three lucky Swedes in the press, although one of them was Norwegian, uh, that they had found gold in a creek near Cape Nome on the west coast of Alaska. Within a year, a tent city of 10,000 people had sprung up around the site. You know, not just prospectors, also all the services catered to them, you know, general stores, brothels, saloons. Within a few years, it had become what is now the town of Nome. And the city of Fairbanks, Alaska, had a similar origin. Gold was discovered there in 1902. You know, suddenly Americans are like, Now I get it. Seward's gamble had paid off. Uh, And it would pay off even more. The first oil field in Alaska was found in 1968. Today, 25% of all the oil extracted in the United States comes from Alaska. Not just oil, but also uh, whale oil, fur, copper, gold, timber, fish, platinum, zinc, lead and petroleum, which suddenly makes the territory feel like the best possible purchase you could imagine. And the treatment of the natives nonetheless remained discriminatory. Uh, The Bureau of Indian Affairs in the 1860s began a campaign to eradicate indigenous languages there and religion and art and music and dance. Um, It was only in 1936 that the Indian Reorganisation Act authorised tribal governments to form. Before that, they had no say over their own country. And for their part, Alaska natives have never said that they ever gave up any sort of title to the territory and they haven't ceded anything. And so they remain in the state of feeling excluded from the land that they continue to claim as their own. Yeah, eventually in 1971, President Nixon signed the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which agreed to pay the indigenous people of the region $960 $960 million in compensation for basically sort of retroactively extinguishing all of their claims to the land. It's funny, though, to think, given that this is a place that most Americans listening to this still won't have visited, that there was this moment in the 1860s where it was actually one of the more diverse places in America. Um, Seward's son went there in 1869 and wrote, quote, there was a curious medley of population and costume. Russians in their national dress, he'd still stayed behind, United States soldiers in their blue uniforms, Indians in blankets and feathers, and traders and travellers clad in the latest styles of Montgomery Street, San Francisco. Yeah, and it really does make you imagine what it would have been like to be there at that symbolic flag switching at the governor's residence on this day in history. I mean, it didn't get off to the best start. You know, it didn't bode particularly well. As the Russians attempted to lower the flag while the military band played, it snagged on the spar at the top of the pole. There then followed an unedifying spectacle where first one Russian soldier and then a second Russian soldier unsuccessfully attempted to scale the flagpole. (laughs) Eventually, a third soldier was able to get to the top and untangle it so it could kind of 
flutter listlessly to the ground. <laughs> hey, you underlings, climb that frozen <laughs> flagpole. <laughs> yeah, it was probably very icy. That yeah. may have explained it. Do it for your country. Which one? Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow. Well, he eats a frog and he bombs up the frog. That's what he does. <laughs> it's like, that's not magic. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.